So collective action problems are this whole idea where individuals acting in their own self-interest can mess up society and can lead to inferior social outcomes. So we just saw this with prisoner's dilemma um, where the, the best option, regardless of what the other person chooses, is to choose um, the defect choice, which is bad for society, um, thus creating a social dilemma or a collective action problem. If you're in a, a stag hunt situation, um, your perfectly rational choice, if you assume the other person is going to defect, even though they might not be, but if you think that they are, then you're going to choose to defect, and then that's going to make it worse off for everybody, thus creating a social dilemma or a collective action problem. Um, there are all sorts of things that stop us from cooperating naturally. Um, in game theory world, this is this, this idea of uneven payoffs. If one person will benefit more than another person, then they're going to choose that, that situation more. So far, all of the games that we've looked at have had pretty even payoffs. Like with Anil and Bala, um, they're each going to benefit basically the same amount um, regardless of what they choose. Or with the prisoners, yeah, with the prisoners dilemma situation. Or with the, the Bakken Stravinsky Mexican, or not Mexican, um, Chinese restaurant versus Italian restaurant. It's not that one person gets like 10 million utils and the other person gets five utils. Like they're just getting the same amount of utility. There's no inequality there. But if you have uneven payoffs, if one of the friends is going to get like 50 utils for going to one type of restaurant and only one for going to the other, then they're always going to choose that one and they're always going to gamble on that one. And so then you're not going to see cooperation and the other person is never going to get their their best choice because they always have to go with what the other person's doing. So if you have these uneven payoffs, it's going to mess up this idea of cooperation. This lack of assurance idea is the, the idea that if you decide, if the other person says, I'm going to meet you at a Chinese restaurant, you have to trust that they're going to do it. Um, or in the stag hunting world, if they say, I'm really going to hunt stag, I'm really going to sign this Paris climate accord, I'm really going to show up at this party on time, you have to hope that they do it. And if you can't trust them, if you don't have the assurance that they're actually going to follow through, then you're going to defect. And then that destroys cooperation. If you can trust them, if there is assurance and if there is credibility, then you're going to stay on track and you're going to cooperate. Um, dishonesty can mess stuff up. Um, this is the idea of lying. Um, if they say, I'm definitely going to sign the Paris Climate Accords and stay with it, and then they don't, um, then that messes up cooperation. Selfishness, uh, same idea. If one person really, really wants the payoffs and you know that they're a selfish person, then you're not going to want to cooperate with them. Um, the thing with this, though, is all of these things are things that rational, utility-maximizing people want to do. If you want to get the most happiness out of life, according to economists, you make choices that maximize your utility or that give you the most happiness points in a game. Um, and so if you have to lie or be dishonest or be selfish to do that, so be it, say economists. Um, don't do that, say ethicists and people that have morals. Um, but that's, that's what happens in these game theory games um, where people are going to choose the best option for them, which then creates the social dilemmas. So how do we fix all of this? How do we make it so that people stop being dishonest and we even out the payoffs and we ensure um, cooperation somehow? Um, there are a whole bunch of different strategies. You can use altruism, um, which is this social idea, the social norm that we should um, help other people out and think about other people and not be selfish. Um, so if we can um, teach norms of altruism to people, then that will help with this idea of assurance um, where people will act in the collective good or in the interest of the collective good because of feelings of altruism. So that's one way to help solve these collective action problems. Um, we already talked about this in the prisoner's dilemma section. If you have a repeated game that there's lots of iteration, you can figure out what the other person does, how they respond, then eventually you could settle on some sort of cooperative equilibrium um, and everybody's going to cooperate as long as you're repeating forever. Um, if you can maintain this forever repetition, then that's going to help. As soon as you know the end, um, then the selfishness part kicks in and you're going to start defecting in the round right before the end and then the round right before the round right before the end and etc. all the way until cooperation has gone. Um, if you can punish people for defecting, um, then that changes the payoffs and they're not going to want to defect because they don't want punishment. And we'll talk about this later in the semester, um, how societies have figured out um, different ways of punishing free riders. 
um, in the absence of, of actual norms or actual laws. Um, we'll read some examples from um, an economist or a political scientist named Eleanor Ostrom. Um, she's one of the only political scientists to get the Nobel Prize in economics. And her research was all about how fishing communities in Turkey were able to make it so that there was not overfishing um, and that the fish stocks were not depleted. Um, but they did it without setting specific laws. They did it without creating kind of a ministry of, of fishing. Um, they just did it because they figured out a punishment system and um, they created kind of informal institutions for monitoring fishing. Um, and they were able to, as a community, um, solve these issues. And we also see this with um, the, the movement to defund police, for instance. Um, activists who've been working on this for years um, aren't trying to push the world into anarchy, but they're trying to push the world into this idea of taking on more of a community responsibility and having communities punish defectors. Um, and part of this work was actually done by Eleanor Ostrom, who did this, these Turkish fishing villages that we'll learn about later in the semester. Um, that work was informed by um, um, her research on police um, departments in southern Indiana, where she was working um, at the University of Indiana. And she was looking at police stations there and found that the smaller the police station was um, and the whole police unit, um, and the more fragmented it was, instead of having like a mega department to have smaller departments in charge of homicides or detective work or forensics or whatever, um, then that gave people more, the community, more of an ability to weigh in on, on policing um, and to enforce norms of, of punishment, not like incarcerating people, but like if somebody commits a crime or does something wrong against somebody else, then the community steps in and figures out a way of, of collectively punishing that person rather than just sending them off to jail. So this, this does have like real life application, um, like having this, these norms of punishment and inculcating altruism into people, like this is a thing that happens. Um, norms and institutions, are these ideas of just having structures that are, are available for making sure that people can coordinate. Um, if you have an institution or a rule that says you should not steal, um, then that will help prevent stealing. And then if people start stealing, then you can um, turn to the punishment aspect and use communities to um, either shun the person or help correct the person. Um, or in the case of uh, the carceral state, you can incarcerate them. Um, and so that's like all of these methods exist so that you can ensure cooperation between all different actors in society. Um, more broadly, this is all just public policy. Um, public policies exist to help people cooperate with each other and, and end up in good outcomes for society. Um, and so that, that's why we have policies. So an example of this um, from some of the podcasts you looked at here is this idea of grazing. Um, and we'll talk about this later in the semester as well when we get to market failures. But grazing is an interesting type of good um, because it is not a public good. It is what is called a common pool resource where it is not excludable. Anybody can bring their animals to graze here um, in public lands, but it is rivalrous. If you bring a um, hundred cows to this field um, and they eat all of the grass, then somebody else cannot bring their hundred cows to the field. And so you end up with kind of a bad situation here. Um, the podcast that you listen to is about water rights in California, um, where if you have farmers, their incentive is to overwater their crops um, because almonds, uh, for instance, are a very thirsty plant. You need lots and lots of water for it. Um, there's no way of monitoring how much each farmer is taking from the water system. And so the incentive is use a ton of water, but then that starts depleting the water um, because it's rivalrous. It's not excludable. Everybody has access to the water, but it's rivalrous because if you take all of the water, then it means other people can't use the water. So we can actually draw this out as a game situation here, where if you have two farmers in California, they have to choose to either use the normal amount of water or double their water use. And so that's what we have these payoff matrix, this payoff matrix here. So um, they could both use water normally and each get six utils. Um, they could both double their water use and only get three utils. If one of them doubles and the other person doesn't, the person who ends up doubling um, gets eight utils because there's tons of water for them to use and they're, they're super happy. They only get three here because the water gets depleted because the other person is also doubling. And so that's kind of a sad outcome here. Um, and then the person who uses water normally while the other person doubling their use, they only get two utils because they're running out of water and it's sad for them. And so that's also what we see here. Um, if farmer one 
doubles their or uses water normally and farmer two doubles, that's going to be sad for them. So if we go through the same row and column situation here, if farmer one knows that farmer two is going to use water normally, what should they do? They could either get six utils or they could get eight utils. So the best option is going to be for farmer one to double their use. Um, if they know that farmer two is going to double their use, what should farmer one do? They could either get two if they use water normally, or they could get three if they doubled their use, which means they should also double their use, which gets us into this world of a prisoner's dilemma. Farmer one should always double their water use regardless of what farmer two does. Um, and if we do the same thing row wise, if you're farmer two and you know farmer one is going to double their use, you could use water normally and get six utils, or you could double your water use and get eight utils. So you're going to double your water use because that gets you the most points. If you know farmer one is going to use water normally, or if you know that they're going to double their water use, um, you could either use normal amounts of water and get two points or double your use of water and get three points. So you're going to choose this one, which leads to one Nash equilibrium where everybody is defecting all the time, regardless of what the other person chooses which is bad for the environment and bad for everybody. Everybody's doubling their water use. People are getting less, um, less benefit from their crops, um, and that's just bad. But that's kind of the world that we fall in. But we can actually fix this in a few different ways. We can set up a structure. We can set up institutions. We can change the payoffs here to make it so that people don't end up in this situation. Um, so if you could change the payoffs so that normal water use is more valuable, then people aren't going to choose to defect. So if we look back at here, if you could make it so that like, even though using water normally gets you lots of points and collectively gets you 12 utils for all of society, there's still benefit to cheating and getting eight points here. So if you could somehow use policy, for instance, to give tax benefits to people who use water normally or do something to make the six higher, if you could make the six a 10 or even a nine, that would be enough to get farmer one to not try to go for this eight and instead go for use water normally. So if you can do something to change this number to boost it up or do something to change this eight to move it down, then you're gonna end up with different outcomes. And so what you essentially have are what are called policy levers, where you can manipulate these numbers somehow, which then shift the outcomes that you get. And so that's, that's one thing you can do with policy, is you can change these payoffs. Um, another thing you can do is make water a common property and make it so that everybody owns it. It's like collectively owned um, and have one person, like a rotating system of who's in charge of, of divvying out the water in a specific week. This is what the Turkish um, fishermen did in Eleanor Ostrom's work is um, they collectively decided that this whole bay for fish um, was a common resource and they all had to work together to make sure it wasn't depleted and they had the whole governance structures that they invented. Um, another solution is you could privatize the water and let one person control it and then they could sell access to the water or they could make it so like they could overuse it on their own if they wanted, but they're not going to want to do that because they want to keep the water for themselves. They don't want to deplete the resources. And so that fixes some of the, the access or some of the overuse issues, but it doesn't fix access issues. Then suddenly one person has all the resources and other people don't. Um, but it does kind of get you out of that defect defect world. And so there are ways that you can use public policy um, and change the incentives and change kind of uh, governing structures and governing, governing institutions to get away from this defect defect world into this happier world where everybody's better off. And so that's, again, why we've spent so much time talking about game theory here is that even though these are fake numbers, um, you can imagine like these numbers do kind of represent reality. Um, farmers aren't getting six utils for using water normally and eight if they cheat, utils are fake. But they're, again, if they're using water normally, they're getting some amount of benefit. And that benefit is higher if they cheat. Um, and so that, that does get reflected here. Um, the numbers can be whatever you want, but as long as it reflects what you see in reality, then it's a useful model and a useful way of thinking about the world. And so that's why we cover this. And then the next section, we'll do a little bit more of this and we'll talk more about this idea of policy levers and how you can actually manipulate these things and 
Um, there are unintended consequences that might occur if you if you mess with these payoffs too much. Um, people will choose the wrong things, and it can mess things up. So, game theory is 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 tricky. It takes a little while to to wrap your head around. But once you do, it's a it's a useful way of thinking about how people interact and how societies interact with each other. So that's why we're covering it. So have fun with your problem set. You'll have lots of practice with this there and it should be fun.